As an experienced clinician in the diagnosis and treatment of asthma in the workplace, so we call upon Dr. Barney to begin his presentation. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir, for those words of introduction. Um, after the break, we'll be starting our session with looking at occupational asthma in healthcare workers. Now, occupational allergies are, on the whole, very under-recognized, under-diagnosed, under-treated, and under-reported. And among the occupational allergies, asthma is probably one of the commonest uh, occupational allergic uh, hazard. So it is important that we recognize occupational allergies, occupational asthma, and treat them so that, uh, and treat or prevent them so that we can take care of this subset of our healthcare uh, individuals, which will lead on to less work absenteeism, less uh, will increase the productivity of their work. So, work-related asthma is a umbrella term that uh, comprises both work-aggravated asthma and work related new onset asthma. Now, uh, the difference between the two is that someone may have already have asthma. Now, as asthma, for those of you who are not too aware, is a hyper-responsiveness of the bronchial airway to uh, some particular stimuli, and it causes airway obstruction, narrowing of the airways, which is reversible to bronchodilators. And a patient could have asthma, and this because he's exposed to some things in the, in the workplace, it may get aggravated, or it can particularly be because he's exposed to some, some occupational um, uh, allergies because of which his asthma is triggered, in which case it is called occupational asthma. And this occupational asthma can be either, can be of two times, types. One is, it can be because of uh, sensitizer induced, where the patient gets sensitized to a particular allergen in the workplace and subsequently develops a response to it. Or it can be irritant, very obnoxious stimuli, which immediately cause symptoms, and that is termed reactive airway disease. Now, uh, this sensitizer-induced asthma is also called asthma with a latent period, and it can be either IgE independent or dependent. IgE is a immunoglobulin E, which is a marker of atopy or allergy in an indivi individual. I would pause here to tell you about a scenario of one of the patients I encountered who has been working in our anatomy department and he presented with features of asthma. Now, um, while I was about to treat the asthma, I asked him a question, uh, how long have you been in the anatomy department? And he said, I've been working there as an attender uh, housekeeping attender for the last five years, and before that he was working in some other place. And interestingly, his symptoms duration correlated to his time of work in the anatomy department. So I went on further to ask what really precipitates his symptom, and every morning he comes to the anatomy department, takes out the dead body, the um, cadavers from the uh, formalin tank, and places it for uh, students to examine and that formalin has been the factor which was triggering bronchoconstriction in him and uh, he was shifted out of the work and became free of symptoms. So it is important to recognize uh, occupational asthma in the background of many bronchial asthmas that we see. Uh, occupational asthma is not that uncommon. We don't have uh, much uh, uh, incidence and prevalence data from India, but uh, in the UK, uh, around 3,000 new cases are diagnosed every year. And an interesting fact is that 10 to 25% of adult onset asthma is because of occupational asthma. So if someone presents while who's working in the hospital with, uh, 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 with asthma, which is uh, uh, onset in the adult age group, we need to probe into whether one of the occupational exposures could be a cause for the asthma. And the incidence could be underestimated by as much as 50%. Now, there are uh, those the recognized agents which can cause occupational asthma are more than 400. They can be divided into high molecular weight and low molecular weight um, substances. Um, uh, this is a paper which looks at uh, a lot of uh, 
occupational asthma and latex among the high molecular weight agents and formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde and several drugs among the low molecular weight agents stand out as risks for uh, occupational asthma in the health profession. Uh, as mentioned earlier, um, IgE and non-IgE mediated responses can be there for low molecular weight uh, uh, agents, whereas the high molecular weight agents are almost always by um, I, through the IgE pathway. But the irritant is induced asthma is, uh, does not fall into any of these categories, and it just, it's a multiple cascade of events that leads on to bronchospasm without a latent period. There are several risk factors which are identified for someone to develop occupational asthma. Not, not uh, although several people are expo exposed to the same allergy in the, in the hospital, not everyone develops uh, asthma. So it, it depends on their level and duration of exposure. Importantly, it has been found there are some papers indicating that those who smoke have a higher incidence of developing uh, occupational asthma, those who are atopic, that those who are having underlying family history or personal history of being having tendency to allergy have more chance of developing occupational asthma. Those who have concomitant allergic rhinitis and conjunctivitis secondary to occupational problem could develop occupational asthma in the future, future and there are several genetic factors as well. So the symptoms of asthma are cough, breathlessness, wheeze, chest tightness, and if this is in relation to work, we need to consider occupational asthma. Now the diagnosis history forms a very important part of diagnosis of asthma, and more so in occupational asthma because you have to relate the asthma to um, the work. Examination may give some findings like wheezing, ronchi, which may indicate asthma. Uh, PFR is peak expiratory flow uh, meter. That is a picture that we, you see on the right side. And this is a very handy instrument because it, is, uh, it can be transported anywhere and it can even be used in the work, workplace. And it gives, it is, it, it, uh, we ask the patient to take a deep breath and blow fast into it. And it gives a good indicator of the narrowing of the airways. And if, if this can be correlated at work, then it helps us to diagnose asthma. When this falls, we suspect asthma. Uh, spirometry is a standard procedure which is done in the lab, the IgE. We can do a skin prick test towards uh, diagnosing asthma and we can go give an inhaled drug called methacholine which induces uh, bronchoconstriction and we can diagnose asthma. So putting all together, if you want to diagnose asthma, you need to have a compatible clinical history. You can, if there's a clinical history, you can do a skin test or an IgE. Then you can measure non-specific bronchial hyperreactiveness by a spirometry. If it is normal and the subject is still at work, then there is no asthma. If it is increased, then it, you have to differentiate between occupational and non-occupational asthma. So then if the subject is still at work, uh, then you can challenge them with specific inhalational tests. And if they turn out to be positive, they have occupational asthma. If negative, non-occupational asthma. If they are not at work, then you challenge them. If they are negative, you need to put them back to work and re-challenge them to decide whether they have occupational or non-occupational asthma. This is a graph to indicate that when normal response through IgE-mediated mechanisms, patients can have either a early response. The x-axis shows the hours after which, expo after exposure, that the lung function actually drops. So patients can have early response, a late response, or a dual response. Uh, the early response, it's around one hour, and the late response is after five or six hours. So this needs to be kept in mind when we are trying to correlate work exposure and development of symptoms and features of asthma. So the treatment of asthma is by avoidance of the allergent or the irritant and medical management of asthma by controller and rescue inhalers. Now we have to focus on prevention. So if you look at what is the primary prevention for occupational asthma, you have to reduce the exposure in the workplace. So this can be done either by substitution or process modification and changing the production of the, the, the substance that is causing the asthma. Or like Dr. as Dr. Alex mentioned, we need to make environmental measures to prevent exposure or personal protective measures like a respirator. Secondary prevention would include early 
detection of the disease. If someone is exposed to and has a possibility of developing occupational asthma, you give them um, yearly questionnaires or yearly spirometry to detect asthma. Or finally, tertiary prevention would include minimizing uh, someone is already diagnosed occupational asthma, then you prevent them from um, uh, getting further symptoms. So you can do that by either uh, ex decreasing the exposure or you can take them from that workplace. Like this example that I mentioned, I was very easily able to take this uh, uh, housekeeping attendant from the anatomy department to some other department. But uh, in, for someone else, that may not be possible. Then only decreasing the work exposure will be the only way by which we can uh, tertiarily prevent bronchial asthma, so with, uh, occupational asthma. So with that, I would close. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Bani. Uh, we'll take questions at the end of the session.